Hey, welcome to Con Carolina's Television. I am Bronner. And I'm your co-host, Ray. And we are here with some very special guests from the um, LARPing world. Um, they're going to explain all of that to us because, you know, some of us are a little ignorant. But, um, yeah, so without further ado, let's get a little introduction going on. And we'll have ladies go first. Um, I'm Jess. I'm Gary. And I'm Nick. Um, I'm a longtime LARP runner, uh, longtime LARP player. Sweet. Well, it is great to have you guys on the show. For sure. Um, obviously, probably the biggest looming question is just what is LARPing? Tell us a little bit about that. Anybody chime in? What do you feel it is? Is it different for you than it is other people? It stands for live action role play. And for anybody that's familiar with gaming, tabletop gaming, stuff like that, it's like D&D, but without dice. You really just play everything out, dress up like your characters, whatever your character would do, you just do it. Um, and there's different kinds of LARPs between buffer LARPs, which are very action-oriented, and lots of RP and stuff. Uh, there's also parlor LARPs where a lot of the action is used using other mechanics. They'll use paper, rock, scissors, or something like that, or just like one die roll. And that's popular with games that are like Vampire the Masquerade or Werewolf the Apocalypse, a lot of the World of Darkness stuff. Um, hmm. that, that's my interpretation of it's, I think that's pretty good. I'd say the biggest difference between the two is uh, Parlor LARP is less costume demanding. Um, lot, there are those of us who, when we do Parlor LARP, dress up a lot. That's just so much fun. I think she just she dropped. Uh, All right. Oh. All right. Take All right so I, well, I've noticed some pretty elaborate costuming, but um, starting with you, uh, Nick, how long have you been LARPing? I've been LARPing, man, I had to sit down and do the math on this thing. It's either eight or nine years at this point. Um, it's, and it's been fantastic. Uh, you know, I, my, my whole transition from LARPing, like, you know, like Gary was saying, if you've done table topping, you know, you do D and D, you do different types of role play. LARP is like the next step of that. It's like actually just next doing level. it, living that adventure. And it was just like a, it, for me, transitioning into LARP was such an obvious step because I was like, you know, it would be so much better if we could actually see it, if we could physically represent it and do it in an environment. And that's the big difference for me. What LARP is, is we take the intentions that we have when we try to live our fantasy through role play games through tabletop and we actually act them out. All right. So, Gary. Are you about the same way? I mean, did you start with tabletops and D&D &D and that kind of stuff? Or did yeah. someone introduce it to you? Or how did you get involved? Um, I started in 1997. So wow. it's, it's been a hot minute. A lot longer um, than eight or nine years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I was into D&D &D and stuff starting in like 1989, 1990. And then in high school, my friends introduced me to the World of Darkness games, Vampire, Werewolf. And at some point, about 97, a friend of mine, Jason, told me there's this new thing called LARP, and you don't roll dice, where everybody dresses up, and everything's just so much more fun. And I went to one game, got killed, but was hooked. So wow. that, that was it from there on out. All right, Jess, how, how long have you uh, been doing this and how did it all begin? Um, I started LARPing when I was 18 or 19, so it's been a while. Um, and I went to this like one shot, somebody's backyard. There was probably 25 of us, but it was all Lord of the Rings style, except everybody was playing a Hobbit. It was this absolutely bizarre experience, but... I I am so into that. That's just my genre. So I loved everything about it. And um, it was, it was my weird gateway. It's such a strange. So then I did um, a lot of 
uh, parlor LARP. I did Avalon for a while, which is another North Carolina LARP. So just in and out over the years between parlor and boffer. And now we're pretty much just boffer LARPers. Okay, what's the word you're saying? Boffer? Boffer. It's, uh, it's, it's what you call the weapons we use. They're foam. Um, oh, and they make kind of a boffing sound. Is that where that comes from? No. I think, okay. yeah. That's a really good question. I'm actually not 100 percent sure, but it's spelled B O F F E R. Someone wants to look it up. Yeah, it just sounds like something like a a, a foam like weapon would make, like a boffing sound. But makes sense. Yeah. All right. That's your shabby. So, I mean, obviously, with every aspect of geekdom, there's a little bit of a stigma to it, and we kind of catch a little flack. So, how do you guys? You know, does it bother you? Do you just not even worry about it? How do you deal with that stigma that comes with it? Like, it, it used to bother me a little bit, I guess, you know, right out of high school or stuff like that, you know. But as I've gotten older, it doesn't really bother eh. me at all. And it's whatever. the rise of geekdom, I mean, gaming is more popular oh. now than it ever has been. Right. For sure. So now when I mention LARP to somebody and they, they're curious, they ask what it is, and then I start to go into the description, they just kind of start, oh, that's so cool, oh, that's so neat, can I go try that, where do I go? And of course, I'll try to send them to the websites or, you know, do whatever I can, but yeah, it used to be a little bit of a stigma with it, and then because there were some YouTube videos that had a guy like Throwing these seed packets, yelling lightning bolt, <laughs> lightning bolt, and uh, there was definitely a little bit of that stigma with that. So when I described it to somebody for the first time, they were like, "Oh, like the lightning bolt, lightning bolt." And I'm like, no, well, yeah, kind of, but it's really cool. Um, I, I will say funny. it is a much easier sell to somebody who has done tabletopping before, like somebody sure. who's familiar yeah. with D&D &D and they like already have a foot in the nerd door telling them like, look, you know, it's the same thing you do at the tabletop. We just actually act it out and we have a rule set that makes it so we can actually fight with each other and do it safely. You know, then it's 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 a lot easier. But when you're telling somebody who just has like no idea, they don't even know tabletopping, right? To take them to we dress up like right. we live Lord of the Rings, we go out in the woods, we beat on each other for a while. Like that can that can melt some brains. And so yeah, like I'll take different. it to a point. Yeah. Like you have to at that point be like, you know, you you see theater, right? You see theater when people yeah. dress up, they inhabit a scene. It's no different than that. We're just doing it improvisationally. So and see, that's one of the things I was gonna say because when I was in high school, you know, theater was the thing that was like, you know, it was not cool. I was in theater. And then it's amazing to see how far we've come where like, I know last year at Con Carolina is having the LARPing groups there. It's, it's easy for people to say, Hey, wow, that's out there. You don't have to feel bad. Like, you know, I enjoy that stuff. So, um, in real life, I'm a game design teacher and I actually teach game design to high school students and the huge rise in just being a gamer and being totally okay with that weirdness in yourself. Like, I don't think it's, it's different than I'm sure it was when Gary started gaming. Um, the fact that I run around as an orc periodically on weekends is like, mm -hmm. my kids are like, I want to see a picture of that. So, I mean, I don't, I, I don't experience that stigma, but I surround myself with nerds all day, every day. Sweet. Did you just call Gary old? I Is did. I, I sometimes I call him Peepaw because no. it warms the cockles of my heart, <laughs> and I encourage you to do the same. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm way older than this guy. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. He could be two seconds older than me. You have to take every opportunity. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, like when I was growing up and whatnot, and I play, I, I played D and D since the original Red Box, right? So. Um, I had friends, like I was like golfing, like at an exclusive, like awesome country club. Not, I wouldn't say I was golfing. I was drinking scotch and smoking cigars while other people were golfing. But we saw golfing. that <laughs> it is, but we saw this huge crowd of people at the park, like down in the valley. And it really looked like 
they were having a war. So I, I was pretty intrigued at that point. So, you know, after I got all said and done, we walked over there and I met a couple of cool cats that I ended up playing with, not <coughs> LARPing with. I've never done that, but um, they also were very big into still playing D&D on a regular basis and, and doing that kind of stuff. So it seems to be a, a pretty big community that share a lot of hobbies together, not just the LARPing. I mean, there's blacksmithing that people do, leather crafts, costuming, all that kind of stuff. But what I really want to know is, is there a hierarchy in LARPing? Do you have a king and a queen? And like, do you, are you like at a certain level and aspire to, to go higher? What's the story behind that? anybody sick so, yeah i'll go ahead um i don't see the way i look at it i don't look at it as though there's a hierarchy um there's pretty much like you're either a person who is on staff for a game in which case you're responsible for storytelling duties so you'll come out you'll play npc roles you'll run content um or you're a player usually usually that's how most games do it um mm -hmm. i don't think there's a hierarchy between the two and i've been in both roles and there's pluses and minuses to both um, some people, I think, have a misconception that, like, if you're on staff, that's a little bit higher, like, that's something to strive to, that you want to achieve to become. But I don't really think it, it works that way in practicality, and that might be a misconception, because really, like, if you're going out there and you're playing the game, you're bringing just as much to the table as anybody else. So I think it's more just a community experience. Um, okay. So I had once watched this kind of this, I don't know if it was a spoof or, or something on LARPing, but it was... They took it very seriously, the people that were doing the LARPing themselves. But there were, were like kings and queens and a royal court and all kinds of things. So I don't know if that's... So you know, every, what, game is, every game is different. Yeah. And there are definitely games that do have that set up. Mm -hmm. um, the games we're in do not. But like in parlor LARPs, especially World of Darkness LARPs, there is a hierarchy within the game. But it's all player dictated player mandated how how you rise to those positions but there are boffo arps that have that set up as well i'm just not involved in one of those at the moment so but it is possible all right so it just varies from group to group is is really kind of what it what's going on and that's kind of one of the beautiful things about it is you know you can tailor it to what you prefer right like you know if that's something that you're into you can tailor it to that and I imagine there's groups out there that have, you know, just it runs the gambit for the imagination. I know in theater, it was the same way. You know, we have that front of the house people that are, you know, on stage. And then you've got your your lights and your sound people. And they're the ones that really kind of make it work for everybody. But you mentioned the boffers again. So what other types of gear do you guys use? Like, is everything crafted or... For you specifically, because I know anybody can go out and buy whatever, but what do you use specifically? I use what she makes for me. <laughs> I make <laughs> everything. <laughs> and whatever is not bought, she makes for me. My, I've got like a priest um, outfit that's got the robe and like a, a capelet and everything. She made all that. Um, the sword and shield and most of my weapons, I end up purchasing them. Um, and then I have a lot of other accessories like a holy symbol that lights up or stuff like that. She makes all that. Um, so yeah, most of my stuff comes from her. <laughs> so cool. we have some, uh, we actually have in the, in the couple of upper we're in, there is a, uh, a friend of ours, um, that runs a place called Fair Trade Armory. Okay. And uh, she comes to the games, and then all of her stuff, she gets her stuff from pre-approved vendors. So she'll come there, have her stuff set up. So if you get the game and you're like, oh, I want to have a sword or an axe or a staff, she's yeah. there. So you can buy them. If you want certain cool accessories, she's there. So, yeah, we're lucky enough to have that. I've been in other LARPs that didn't have that. But luckily, every game, Stephanie's there. And she has all her stuff set up and, and including some stuff from other crafters that are there too. So if you want cool dragon's eye amulets or um, other cool axes made by other weaponsmiths, she's kind of got it all covered for you. 
All right, cool. Yeah. So go ahead. You were going to say something, Jess? Um, so uh, you can also, and he kind of mentioned this, but he didn't really, you can also get custom weapons made. So I make shields and I've, I made Nick shield as well for the last game, which is weird. We don't have any pictures of those, but, um, and I'll make armor, but I don't usually make weapons. So we have another friend who also comes to games. Um, and what's her store? Lucid Illuminations? Is that right? That's a, Lucid Illuminations. That feels right. Um, and she'll make a custom weapon for you. So if your character has a specific type of axe, or if you have a spear made out of a jawbone or whatever it is, she'll make these foam weapons and they're all the same um, same build, the like same durability. safety. Yeah. And safety, yeah. the safety is the big part. As a weapon you might buy, oh, there's a shield. So um, you can you can get almost anything. If you can't make it, somebody else can. So there's there's really yeah. no limit. So do they like set up like a pavilion type marketplace at your events, or or how does how do you go? Do they just have like a, a back of a van that you have to go to or something? Yeah. So um so actually so a, as uh, Gary was saying earlier, Stephanie Creed's fantastic. She runs Fair Trade Armory, and she comes to a number of games in North Carolina, and she sets up her own little area she's got like a table she puts down a cloth a drop cloth to make it look you know kind of like fit with the theme of game and she'll set up the weapons and she'll put them all out there and then you can just go up take a look at what you want she has you can bring your credit card you can swipe it you can bring cash you can buy weapons costuming straight she's from her merchant. and she has her own little area in game um and typically speaking we we treat it like an in-play space like there's an actual weapon vendor if you want to go up you can get some stuff and yeah, it, it goes really great. Yeah, that's cool. Incorporated. It just kind of seems like it's a overlapping community. You know, everybody can rely on somebody for something. Everybody can bring something to the table. Okay. I have just kind of a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, are people allowed to come just watch, like bring a lawn chair and, and just watch you guys go at it, bop each other? It's so that. That's a really good question. Um, I've seen, it all depends on your game. It all depends on the rules of your game, the atmosphere of your game. Um, I've seen a couple of examples where somebody did come and they just wanted to watch. Um, in most cases, they usually dress up. So even if they're not participating, they still look like they're part of the setting. Um, and the real reason for that is you don't want to break immersion. Like you want people to feel like they're in a, in a world that is a fantasy universe that, that, doesn't, that you don't want to break that, that environment, that atmosphere. Um, so I've seen some people do that. Uh, a lot of times when people come and they're just there to observe, before the end of the event, they're playing. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, come observe, come in a costume. And then usually they end up a part of the, the community, just like everybody else. That is so awesome. I can't imagine I'd be able to just sit there and watch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, kind of, of, it's, it's infectious. I mean, I watched you know, the D&D, &D, the Pathfinder games with him, and then before you know it, I'm sitting there playing. That's it's true. It's just infectious. You can't help but enjoy. That's true. I didn't realize that, but that's kind of like the same thing. All right, so let's let's talk about, I know that um, there's not a lot of crafting of weapons, right, between the three of you guys, but you know how they're constructed, I, I take it. So what are some of the, the things that go into a weapon that make them safe, make them durable? Because I've seen some people that were crafting basically for, for cosplay for like a, a convention and like one good thwap of, of, of their staff and it would break in half kind of thing. So how do they, without hurting somebody, how do they make them the way they make them? Do you want me to do this one, or do you want to do it? <laughs> I can give you the idiot's version of it, and then Jess can correct me, which might be very funny. I like that. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I like let's that. that. Right. <laughs> you, so you want to make sure that you have a, a sturdy and safe core to your weapon. Uh, typically speaking, like fiberglass or PVC tends to be, the I think, the industry standard. Then you make sure that that is safely encased in foam. Um, you also have to make sure that you have a soft tip at the top of your weapon. Now, in most games, stabbing is not LARP safe because you, that's the number one way to like break a rib, do something that's going to give somebody an injury. You're not allowed to stab, but you still need to have a tip there that's soft. 
because you know you might accidentally like slice down and then end up pushing forward and hit somebody and you don't want to cause them much damage um, so you have to have something there that is softer than the foam that is used for the base of the weapon um, you also have to make sure like in the case of a latex weapon you would have to seal that with latex make sure that the sealing is, is done correctly um, if that starts to break then what can happen is over time that so the the latex layer will break down then the foam will start to get exposed and the core will start to get exposed and now all of a sudden you're like smacking somebody with a fiberglass rod and that's not safe that's not fun either not fun for anyone <laughs> i mean unless you're into that so, so that is my rudimentary knowledge of it you did a great job um the oh, only thing i think i would add no you really did you did great um most cores are fiberglass and it's usually eva closed cell foam um most weapons i've seen are usually at multiple layers of 10 millimeter thick so by the time it's finished and sanded down and made into the shape of whatever you're going to end with, there's a buttload of foam between anything dangerous and the person you're hitting. And most LARPs use lightest touch, which is we're not trying to wail on you like we're trying to commit a war crime. I need you to know that I've hit you. Um, and sometimes you have to hit harder because there'll be people out there in plate, like actual <laughs> metal armor and you got to hit them like you mean it but it's never ridiculous because yeah. one you're going to hurt somebody and two you're going to break your stuff so at the very least be cognizant of because things are expensive and people like having ribs yeah right so you had mentioned that there's there's a group of people that are stacked do you do, are there referees and stuff that say oh yeah you're hit you're out <laughs> most of the time it's done well okay so it's mostly done in the honor system because you'll have like depending on the game you can have like 50 to 100 people and so having a ref and sometimes we like we play at nighttime so sometimes like being able to d discern like through all the chaos exactly what happened uh you really need people to buy in and that's why it's so important that people like abide by the rule system, that people are right. being honest and faithful and true. And if they've gotten hit, you know, making sure that they take that damage. Now there's some times where like it's chaotic and you might get a hit and you don't realize it. And sometimes somebody will like whisper to you like, Hey, did you get such and such? And then if you, if you did, yep. Got it. If not, Nope. Keep going. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. I take it. Um, but we do have rules marshals and those are more like if you have a question if somebody has a question about the rules or if two people end up in a bit of a dispute because like one person has one understanding of what the rule is and another person has a different understanding those sure. people can be called in to like referee those sort of issues if that makes sense sure it's kind of like a magic tournament you have someone that you just go to to ask a, a question and they just make their decision based upon whatever the rules are so that's cool yeah so i I'm in love with the costumes. So talk to me about the costumes. Do you guys have like, like obviously each group, depending on what you're going to be, you know, doing for the scene is going to have different costuming, but you know, do you guys have like a guideline, you know, like if I showed up for a scene, you were like, give me a guideline as far as what costuming to do or where I could get costumes. Usually I know that a lot of, um, the different fantasy ancestries will have costuming requirements. So if you're playing an elf, you need to have pointy ears. If you're playing a goblin, you need to have, you know, green skin or something. Every <clears throat> troop will have their different requirements right. for um, representing what kind of ancestry you're having for your character. You know, if you're a dwarf with a beard or whatnot. Um, and then a lot of LARPs will also have suggestions for style of dress so if your dwarves are more scottish fashion wise or or maybe more scandinavian or something they'll be oriented towards that or if you're an imperial human and it's more towards roman or greek or english or whatever hmm. so they'll have their own requirements for it and most of the LARPs I've been to, as long as you put forth the effort, like you're not showing up in your Nike shirt and your sneakers trying to grab a weapon, 
you know, you have a basic tunic, some loose pants, and you're trying, most people will be cool with it. And then a lot of times, if you're really into it, other people that are customers or have connections to customers will try to help you out. You know, oh, hey, I noticed you got a tunic. Here's a cool, fancy looking magic medallion thing. You can wear that. Uh, you know, I know Nick has a lot of, a ton of costumes and stuff like that. That if he's like, oh, well, hold on, you're having a merchant. Here, I've got a couple of merchant items to help you with it. Um, so the community is really good about helping people out. As long as you're there that. and you got the heart and you want to do it, everybody usually tries to help out. That's really kind of cool. I'm, can you can you wear your outfits to like the Ren Fair or to a a, a convention? Because I would show them. Oh, yes. like I would Con wear Carolinas, them for instance. Everywhere. Yes, and we do. Uh, yes, we do. We go to the the North Carolina Ren Fair um, <laughs> all the time. In fact, some like the different LARPs I'm involved in will do like this. Hey, this is going to be our weekend. We're all going to show up, and then we'll go there and do photo shoots and all that fun. It's super fun. Um, yeah, the, the costuming that we wear to LARP is typically accepted at most Ren Fairs. Um, it's sweet. gorgeous. And There's it, so much work that goes into it. Show it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about like Con Carolinas? I know that we do like... You guys are coming, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Of course. We do like weapons it. checks and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, so do, do all the weapons that you guys utilize do they meet those requirements yes in fact you couldn't even bring a real weapon into a LARP um there the, there's no the the likelihood of danger we it, we want to keep as low as possible so I can't even imagine being able to get something other than foam out there so I think more than pass and they usually have someone like a weapons marshal checks so, everything yeah at the beginning of the game you'll have your character everybody will take whatever weapons you're going to use up to the weapons marshal they'll check it make sure it's you know not does have too much wit to it uh make sure the everything's still intact it's nice and soft and everything and as long as it passes uh, she she dropped uh but as long as it passes their inspection and everything um, they'll write off, basically they'll sign off on your character, so that way you're good to go. But you have to have all your weapons passed first. first. Welcome yeah. back. So the chat's been pretty active, and I'll be honest, and they love you guys. I think you have a lot of friends in the chat right now. But somebody said something that uh, is kind of interesting, that some LARPs allow Nerf guns. Now, do you guys customize those so that they don't look like a Nerf gun? Like, yes, one hundred percent. Um, we like a so, crossbow, like you cut, make them into crossbows. Um, I mean, you could, or just you could make extension on the thing, right? Well, so the game that, so one game that I'm involved in, uh, Vanguard, uh, they, so they have like steampunk technology as a part uh, of the game, so you can have actual guns as firearms. They call them boomers in the game. They have a different name, uh, and you can use those. We just ask that people paint them and make them look like an actual metal like object as opposed to something that is like but orange and runs. purple and all <laughs> sorts of weird colors. Um, we, the one thing we we're careful about is, so when you say like modification, some people have done crazy things to Nerf guns to make them shoot like twice as hard and twice as fast oh, yeah, over no. twice as much distance. And that's where we kind of have to draw the line because there's a certain point where like we're there's dealing with safety, safety. concerns. Yeah. But making them look, like the redesigning them, adding modifications to them, painting them to make them look kind of realistic, it's 100% awesome. And I've got a few of them myself floating around somewhere. Wow, we should have played show and tell. <laughs> Next time. Next time for sure. All right. That, so, go ahead. What is like a typical day? Like, so you guys are just lay out a day for me you guys all show up at the event you know do we talk about the rules beforehand or is that something you do you know with everybody there <clears throat> um i know like usually at least for for example vanguard and uh 
the other one where that we do a lot is lands of exile and everybody shows up gets in costume gets your character checked in and about 10 o'clock they'll try to do opening announcements you know thanks everybody for coming um here's some reminders about safety issues or uh important announcements for the game or for the um for the play site um after that they give you about 10 15 minutes and then the adventures start coming in you know the last game everybody had the announcements about 10 minutes later after the announcements are done we hear a blood curdling scream out in the woods and here we go so and that's what it is for the rest of the day or that night till three four five in the morning uh then you go to sleep wake up nine or ten have some breakfast inevitably there will be something that needs to be done some kind of adventure some exploration somebody's gone missing um and you can just stay around if you want to and just kind of rp and hang out and enjoy being around everybody or you go explore into spider infested mines or saving kids that have gone missing whatever it is um so there's as much or as little as you want to do. Can I jump in? So yeah. uh, there's also monster time. Um, and every game calls it something different. But it's when you stop playing your character. Some people, some games will say you've gone on watch. Or when uh, we're all in a guild at Vanguard, we say we're going to be cloistered in prayer because we play a, we're all very paladins. But um, if you go out and you play... Um, the undead or a bunch of vampires or an orc or a minotaur or some crazy monster so that the other players, I mean, so that they're enemies. Um, and sometimes that can be just as, as much fun as playing your character. I remember the first NPC time we did at Vanguard this season, um, we were playing pirates and I was laughing so hard. I was trying not to cry um Nick's smiling because he knows exactly what I'm talking about it was so your monster time can be just as cool yes you were can be just (laughs) as cool um as your player time so and that's part of the game sweet that's cool all right so when you're when you guys are 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 doing your event right what you just described as like kind of like a a typical day, you know, a day in the life of a LARPer, right? How about, I mean, do you ever go like on like a week long adventure? I mean, do do people go camping and doing all kinds of, you know, like just stay in character for maybe a weekend? I don't know. So does that ever happen? Yeah, we typically will do a weekend. So usually what will happen, most games go over the course of a weekend and they start Friday night. Um, and you'll arrive Friday night. You'll like Gary was saying, you do your opening ceremonies. You go into play. You play through the game for Friday. You go to bed usually way too late. And if you're a staff member, even later. <laughs> and you wake up way too early. And if you're a staff member, you're up even earlier. <laughs> you know, maybe you're getting like three hours of sleep. Um, and then you get back in it, and you play again all Saturday. And usually what happens is like you run late Saturday night, maybe you run into like Sunday morning because people are staying up and content is still going and whatnot. Um, And then you'll go to bed and then Sunday is usually cleanup day. Um, I heard some games will do like a little bit of like free role play Sunday mornings, but it's not that common because you do need to clean stuff up. Usually you're renting out a site and you need to make sure that you've you've gotten everything swept, everybody's moved out, so that way you maintain a good relationship with the site you're renting from. Sure. Um, and they usually have a time that they need you out by. And then and then Sunday, everybody goes, usually afterwards, you go to lunch and celebrate after the game, and then everybody goes home. Um, some games do, like there are some games that are like special events that'll do like a whole week long thing. Um, you That's not like, that's not your like monthly game. That's usually like that happens once a year and it's like this big thing and you come to this festival and like take off time from work this is a huge ordeal like it's christmas right. for larpers come to this right. thing it's your, it's your vacation <laughs> yeah. like it's your annual yeah. vacation so yep. it better be special right 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, I had a question on the tip of my tongue. Go ahead and ask the next one. <laughs> Did you forget all that? Yeah. It's, you know, <laughs> it goes. So uh, locally, I mean, let's talk about how common, you know, are there a lot of groups locally, you know, nationally? Do you know how, how common is it? You had mentioned uh, Lands of Exile. And I, I know that they're they're going to be putting on the, you know, like yes. the little party scene going they will up, be you there. know, at the con, at Con Carolinas, and if you go to concarolinas.org, you can, you know, get your badges, and if you put in the coupon code CCTV22, then you can get, you know, some money off of that. So go ahead and go there and order your badges now. But anyway, Land of Exiles are going <laughs> to put on the party. On Saturday night, right at um, on the patio at the at the hotel. Um, so you mentioned them. How how many others do you work with? I we we're we play with Lands of Exile and Vanguard, but there's also Shadowmoor. Um, help me, it's gonna be fun. There's a, a so the Shards of Orn is up in the Orn. Raleigh Durham area. There's a bunch of parlor LARP groups. There's a bunch of Mind's Eye Theater, Vampire, where like just tons of those. Um, I know Greensboro has one. There was one in Hickory, Charlotte. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just kind of all over. So, uh, they, yeah, there's way more than I could even count. Um, and a lot, a lot of Buffalo are up north. So uh, a ton of them up north. There's uh, Amnesty, too, in North Carolina. Um, and there's another one that's getting ready to start. Satara. That feels right. There's a lot. They're like termites. Once you find one, there's like 400 more. They're okay. everywhere. So, so does it ever happen where like uh, Vanguard will challenge Lands of Exile to like a little skirmish and you guys get together and do that kind of thing? No, uh, it, not it, it not really. Yeah, sets anyway. yeah, uh, yeah. Like Gary said, usually it's because there's like two different rule sets and they're completely different universes. So like some like some universes have different races than others. Some like like Vanguard uses Nerf guns, Lands of Exiles doesn't. It's more like high mm-hmm. fantasy. So like having that those two things mesh, it'd be interesting. Like I'm a huge fan of multiverse theory and like having something yeah. where that happened with like a crossover a could be interesting. Could but happen. It would it would require a lot of pre negotiation and probably coming up with a system that is a weird combination and conglomerate of the two. Yeah, There's also a weird. lot of shared players, <laughs> like so many shared players oh, between those two LARPs. Yeah. Didn't even yeah. think about that part. So what about like a, a LARP company out of like in like upstate New York says, Hey, we wanna like take on Lands of Exile. <laughs> I would march down okay. and <laughs> and take some people on. Well, I'm always down to I would say any excuse right? to be in a shield wall is a good excuse. Okay. I love that. All right. I think you got the next one. You no, know, I have a question. Yeah. I need to know. I want each of you to tell me what has been your absolute, like your best memory from a LARPing event. Hmm. Like the event that just mm. kicked it off for you, like you will never forget this. It was there's one that's humorous and one that was just epic, and it was the epic one was at uh, an event in a game called Nero, and it was the end of like a two year arc. Uh, so there had just been lots of stuff building up to this. And there were over 200 players, and the big climactic battle had pyrotechnics, and um, there were maybe 130, between 130 and 150 players lined up, and then 40 or 50 of us dressed all in black as these shadows, and it was just this giant battle. And everywhere you look, there's people getting chased by shadows, people chasing shadows, people running in and out of the forest, bodies everywhere. It was, it was just fantastic. And so 
that just solidified it for me to one. Oh, she right dropped again. Is. Yep, she'll be back. Uh, the funny one I had was there was a buddy of mine named Brian, and <clears throat> I was playing a zombie, and the zombie kept regenerating. Every time you'd drop, drop them down, down, they would, <clears throat> I would count to one minute, and then I would spontaneously come back. He didn't know that. He knew that I was coming back, but didn't know how long it was going to take. So they're dragging me back, and they say, well, we don't want to take him back to town, so we'll leave him out here, and we'll go get the town and come back and figure out how to permanently kill him. And so they asked Brian's care, just wait here. Watch her <coughs> make sure nothing goes wrong. So they all run off. Well, I know with the stats that I was giving for the zombie, I could take Brian in a one-on-one -on -one fight. So... He, as we're waiting, he falls out of character a little bit. We're kind of chatting a little bit out of game. But in my head, I'm counting up 23, 24, 25, 26. And I know when I get to 60, I'm just going to wail on him. <clears throat> but he doesn't know that. So he's standing there, and he's got a glass of water, and he's just talking to me. And finally, I hit 60. And I say, I was laying on the ground, and I just say, regeneration complete. And I sit up as fast as I can and just start going after him. And he is just kind of panicked because there's nobody around. So he just throws the water in my face, <laughs> not meaning to just sort of like instinct to be like, get off me. And, and then eventually I drop him, but the town comes and they finish me off and, and everything and save him. But that will always stick out in my mind as one of my favorite buffer memories was him throwing water in my face because he was not expecting the zombie to come after him. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> what about you, Nick? What do you got? Got any epic stories? I, yeah, we, honestly, you could probably do another one of these. It's just like Nick sits down and tells you every story <laughs> from LARP. I've been on so many. So like just isolating one thing and being like, this was, oh, this is it. Like, I can't even do it. But what I can say, like, in terms of just the most epic thing I think I've been involved in when it comes to LARP. Um, so the game Vanguard that I, I co-own and, and have been on the plot staff for years and years and years for, uh, we recently had, like, so there was the first phase, we call it our 1.0 game, and we brought that to a close. And we knew leading up to this, like, this was going to end, and then we are going to relaunch the game 500 years later. And so bringing that story to an end, this eight-year-long story, and knowing that, like, we had, you know, a series of events to lead up to this, bringing the game to a close that felt like it resonated, it felt appropriate, and it ended on this, like, this, just this hopeful spot of optimism after all the experiences that everybody has been, to, been through together. And seeing all those characters united together in the tavern and looking around at, like, multiple generations of eight years of this game, all in one area, watching them like smiles on their faces as we do just this like kind of ending scene leading up to what's next. Um, that stands out to me. It was incredible. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I later went on to like go find my distance and like really just, um, you know, sit with my emotions on that. Cause it was so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, also beyond that, uh, I know like some of my friends are watching this right now. I have to mention an NPC I played named Oberon. Uh, Oberon was a goofy, goofy character uh, in the steampunk game I play in. He was an automaton, but he had no like no real knowledge of like contextual social understanding. So, but he did know like how to communicate. So, like everything he learned, he learned from just picking up a piece of text and reading it. And he was like, "Okay, I guess this is who I am." There's a guy in here named Oberon. That's me now. And he went on these crazy misadventures where he would do insane things. Uh, I know at one point he was given uh, one person in town gifted him with like a toy horse that he pretended was alive and he named it and would ride around on it through town. Yeah, he was so, a, he was a lovable. We're being nitwit. told in chat that it's King Oberon. King Oberon. Yeah, he <laughs> self-proclaimed himself king, uh, which caused him some problems later. We did a whole trial. We actually did your trial at Oberon's trial was at Con Carolinas. Oh, yeah, okay. last year Oberon was put on trial. Uh, <laughs> he he was acquitted. Because he's just too lovable and too innocent to, to commit crime. Um, he's just a great character. 
Yes, and so in one in one um in one adventure we did, um, Oberon came into town and told people that his horse had been stolen and it was stolen by these cherubs, and he was like they're little small demons. And so there were a bunch of people in town who were like, "We're gonna fight demons! Everybody suit up, put your armor up, let's go!" So like we roll down into ta or into the, into the mod into the area, and they get there, and they see that it's actually just children. Just actual children, and Oberon had no idea. He didn't know the difference between cherubs, demons, and actual children. And it was just so funny and lighthearted. And I got to, like, wrestle with some children trying to get my horsey back. And the players had to, like, basically disaggregate this dispute from this un misunderstanding. And there was more to it than that. It was super fun. Where, where did you come up with the name Oberon? Just out of curiosity. Um, I... I know of it. I mean, it, there's the Fairy King Oberon from, uh, you know, A Midsummer Night's Dream and, yeah. you know, old old folklore. Uh, I also know, like, DC Comics, there was a character named Oberon. It just stuck out to me as something that sounded almost like a fusion of fantasy and also sounds kind of machine-like. Mm -hmm. So I went with that. Cool. It's a good poll. All it? right, Jess, what do you got? Um. And hopefully my camera will stay. I don't know why my computer's haunted and just keeps dropping me. But, um, uh, okay, so I'll do a different one. So probably my coolest LARP adventure um, was in New Orleans. So we went to a destination um, LARP. It was a big, it, for Vampire the Masquerade, it was a grand conclave, which is like, dude, everybody who's anybody goes, you're your, you wear your fanciest, vampire ensemble um and i was playing a toreador who was last alive in the late 1940s and did not really transition out of that very well so um but the room we were in and, and vampire is a parlor larp so you you don't hit anybody that is that is not something you do there um, do you get to do you get to bite people no <laughs> no i oh. no no, that's going to be a hard no. But yeah. um, the, uh, well, everybody's a, no. everybody's a vampire there. So, like, there's no one's playing just like a dude. You'd be playing right. a sandwich. So that's not really, but um, we were there and they had uh, Rose pieces Pete. from uh, American Horror Story that they had rented um, to be, like, set pieces in this room and there were this these old this old furniture and you're in this old new orleans hotel and it was just it was unbelievable wow. to be there at this event just the the way they had really over over the top of the setting and um we were there with i don't know like eight other people we knew but there was it was just it, it it's very interesting to go to a destination larp instead of um like your normal game, just to get out and go other places. And there are a lot of games that do that, um, especially in the parlor LARP world. But yeah, it was it was very, very fun. Wow. Do you, do you know of LARP groups that are not necessarily from like North America, but, you know, South America or Canada or where? So I have a serious love of Canadian LARP because they do not play. So they will have like, full structures that are built year round and movie level quality costumes. And just like, if you want to see some unbelievable stuff, um, all of, I'm trying to think of some good examples of specific Canadian marks. They're all so good. I'm sure there's a dumpy one up there somewhere. It has to exist, <laughs> but all of them are unbelievable. Canada don't play. Canada don't play. <laughs> <laughs> they, they never really do. I mean, do that's they? awesome. That's really cool, though. Sorry. I guess it's just your imagination is the limit. So oh, yeah. You can make it as simple just or as extravagant yeah. as you want. So how does someone like me, uh, you know, or a newbie or whatever, um, find a group? And how accepting are they to potential new members? There, so there's definitely some Facebook groups. If you just look up um, like North Carolina LARPs on Facebook, it'll come up with a few. Um, and then once you know the names, Vanguard, 
Um, there's an exile. Oh, she's dropping. Uh, Shadowmore or anything like that. Um, you'll find them on there. And uh, yeah, the, the, everybody is, is always welcoming. Every LARP I've ever been to. Um, buffer, parlor, or otherwise are always super welcoming for new people. Um, even if they were to just show up, um, I mean, I don't know how you would at a buffer lark because it's usually kind of way out in a park somewhere. But um, even if you were to just find out the day of, get your ticket and get there, usually people are all too uh, happy to help you learn the rules and get into it and just start playing because new players are the lifeblood for it. And it's usually the more the merrier. That's really cool. Especially for people that have never done it. I mean, maybe that have role played, you know, and played D&D &D or Pathfinder or whatever that really want to just take it to the next level. So just, you know, look it up on Facebook and get in contact with some of these people and or go to the con and talk to the people from, you know, Vanguard or Lands of Exile or and all those new, guys. New player tickets are always like 10 bucks. They're always very, very cheap so that you can test it out without buying a full ticket um, to make sure it's something that you're interested in. And actually, Super. Last Con Carolina is what really kind of got us because we first ran into Lands of Exile at the Last Con Carolina. Got hooked. We had done buffer ops in the past, and we were like, let's jump back into it. And then we've been doing parlor for a long time. We've been doing parlor uh, for a long, long time. Uh, we actually met at a parlor arc. So, um, but then um, at Lands of Exile, we met Nick and then um, started talking about the other LARPs that they're involved with, Vanguard, and then that's just what we do now. <laughs> so how, how much, uh, just saying the last year, do you think you've spent on LARPing? Oh, oh, oh money. question. Yeah, money. <laughs> I, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> I, I don't know that I can Even, afford another hobby. I don't want to oh. think about how much I spent on your Batman stuff. So let's not think about that. <laughs> right. okay. So less because I make our armor. Yeah, true. Less. So if you. I wish I could make his Batman stuff. So if we became friends, that would be good. <laughs> I mean, if you want some armor, you hit me up. Um, I'm sure oh. it's not cheap. <laughs> I I'm also not the person to ask for this because in addition to like I play like two two maybe three games and then so I have those kits but I'm also like running staff for a game which means I have all my NPC kits and then all the stuff that like I have for when people monster for me like throw this on so like my budget for LARP is very different than the cash like the normal players budget would be. Um, but I could say, like, you could probably end up spending, like, you could do it cheap. You could. You could make it work at, like, 100 to 200 bucks and be okay. But you're, if you really want to make it look good, you're probably looking at, like, 500 to a grand. But just you can, the, you can, you can build. So it's not uncommon to, like, hit up a thrift store and you're start crafty. with your level one costume and it be. Yeah regular pants that aren't jeans maybe you buy an appropriate shirt and that and, and regular pants and a belt and that'll get you it sounds enough. like every halloween costume i've ever had apparently <laughs> according to the chat the broader discount is 125 percent so who said that that's the way someone said i get 125 percent off no you get to pay 125 hey oh okay that's not nice all right. Um, all right. So just since we're talking about the chat, what advice would you give to uh, the people that aren't your friends in the audience <laughs> um, that want to start LARPing? What, what's the best thing that they can do? Do it. Totally do just it. Just do it. It, is, do it. it really is just do it. Find a okay, group Nike. that's near you, wherever you're located, whether it's North Carolina, California, Michigan, wherever. Look up you know, Google LARPs, your area, I guarantee you there's one fairly close by. And then just start talking to people because LARPers want more LARPers. 
So if there's stuff that people can do to help you out, they'll probably do it. Uh, because that means if they help you get a costume or something like that, you're going to come, which means their game's going to get bigger and better. If, um, if you're new, don't try to play a loner. That would be my only like real advice. If you're new, play play the the guy who wants help because someone will find you. Nice. The, the yeah. brooding lone wolf in the corner, blah blah blah. <laughs> that is the last one. And my new no strider. Oh, yeah, yeah well, exactly. It's a community activity, so even if you come in as a loner, like you're going to get absorbed in. People love reaching out to people, communicating with them. Uh, there's a lot nice. of games like games typically will have like groups and guilds that form. And people are always looking to grab people and put them into their guilds and have them be a part of the community. Like you will find friends. So even if you're not coming in with a group of people, if you're coming in by yourself, you will find people at the game that want to actively play with you. So do not hesitate. Absolutely. All right. Well, this was amazingly enlightening. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys for uh, stepping up to bat. Um, you guys were great. Wonderful guests, and I'm glad you brought a bunch of people into the chat. Yeah, I love having you guys. Can't yeah. wait to see you in June. In yes. June. Yeah. I'm so June. Sorry. Third through the fifth. Third. We are third through the fifth. Uh, we've got uh, badges for sale right now at congarolinas.org. And if you go on the website and you just click on CC, which is our little um, panther or whatever logo, <laughs> and click on that, and it'll take you right to the Eventbrite. Um, check out and you can choose how many badges you want for how long, if you want the weekend or whatever. But if you put uh, CCTV as your checkout code, then you're going to save some check. money and that's a good thing. So we will be back next Saturday night and we're going to have along the same vein, um, but not LARPing, but we're going to have some costuming people come on from um, Ribbons and Rivets. And they're going to come and talk um, costuming. They did a little workshop at our local comic book store, which is the Comic Mon Store, which is owned by Ray Franks, who's also the gaming coordinator for Con Carolinas. Six degrees of separation. Oh, right? Yeah. And um, his name is Matthew Pinnock. And I'm sure, I think, I'm, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. But they'll be here. They made bracers over at the comic book store. And they were really cool. And um, it was fun. So... He's going to bring some stuff and, and some stories. So tune in next week to our show. We'll be here at 8 o'clock. Um, and with that, I am Bronner. And I'm Ray. And everybody wave goodbye. Peace out. Peace and love, guys. Bye. Bye.